All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is uh, Kelsey Glassfelter, um, and we uh, are going to start the second of three webinars in the GSA Need to Know webinar series. And today we are tackling a, a topic that affects all of us, and that is uh, policy and aging. Um, I am filling in at the moment for Brian Lindbergh, who got pulled away for just a moment. So in the meantime, I will introduce him. Um, Paul is, uh, Brian is the policy advisor for the Gerontological Society of America, and uh, he is going to be joining us along with uh, some of his close friends and colleagues who are really true experts in the field. Um, they've spent their careers supporting programs that serve older adults and other vulnerable populations. Um, I'll introduce them in just a moment, but as a housekeeping note, I wanted to let everyone know that this webinar will be recorded and shared after the conclusion of the session. I also wanted to let everyone know that you can uh, live tweet with us on this webinar using hashtag GSAPolicy2017. So GSA works on policy year-round through participation on Capitol Hill visits, sponsoring Hill briefings, and through our work as part of the Leadership Council of Aging Organizations. We also keep members informed through various communication channels, such as a monthly policy column that Brian writes for Gerontology News. We are lucky to have gathered, as I mentioned, this panel of leaders this afternoon for today's discussion about policy in the field of aging, particularly in the midst of the tax legislation debate. So we are looking forward to a lively discussion and interaction with all of our attendees today. So I'm going to uh, move along and introduce um, our panelists, who I will ask them to give a brief introduction about themselves. And to get to know them a little bit better, I will ask them to share just a quick quick sentence about what is keeping them up at night lately uh, in regards to aging policy. So I'd like to start with Tricia Newman from the uh, Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation. Tricia? Hello? Hi, Tricia. No, this is Ellen. <laughs> oh. Tricia, are you on mute? Perhaps. Okay, um, then let's move on to um, Ellen and we'll swing back around for Tricia. Ellen, do you want to go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I've, I'm at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, a nonpartisan group that focuses on the impact of federal policies on low and moderate middle income Americans. We do a tremendous amount of work on health care and retirement policy and have partner groups in about 42 states that work on those issues at the state level. And I've been at the center for 34 years, and I'm almost ready to decide what I'm going to do when I grow up. Um, what keeps me up at night um, that certainly affects the elderly uh, population and aging policy, but also the rest of the country, is the phenomenal risk that this Congress is going to make one of the most consequential decisions of our lifetime that will cause tremendous harm to the people in the communities we care about by cutting taxes for very wealthy Americans and corporations without paying for it, which will lead, as I'll explain in a few minutes, to very deep cuts in programs that we all agree are absolutely essential to supporting our elderly population. Thank you, Ellen. And uh, I, I also added everyone's Twitter handle to the slide deck, so uh, feel free to tag them along with us as we, as we move along. Um, before I get to Howard, uh, Tricia, were you able to unmute yourself and, and join us for an introduction? Can you hear me now? There you are. Hello, Tricia. Great. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yes, hi. I was introducing myself, but you couldn't hear me. So this is Tricia Newman. I'm a senior vice president at the Kaiser Family Foundation. I direct our program on Medicare policy. I've been here for oh, 20 years or so. It sounds like a lot. Before that, I worked on the Hill. Um, I work on Medicare and aging issues. And what keeps me up at night? Well, that, there's, that's a long list. But what might keep me up right now is thinking about how we're going to make health care affordable for an aging population, both for you know, how, how will we pay for services and also how will we keep it affordable for people? Excellent. Thank you, Tricia. And last but not least, um, we have Howard Bedlin from the National Council on Aging. Howard. Yes, thanks, Kelsey. So, you know, it depends what day it is in terms of what keeps me up at night. Uh, a couple of months ago, it was Congress trying to 
cut Medicaid by about a trillion dollars, which would have been devastating for a lot of low-income, frail older Americans. Uh, today, I have the same issue that Ellen does, that you know, exploding the deficit by a trillion and a half dollars is going to give folks who want to cut Medicare and Medicaid and other senior programs an excuse to really go after them. And uh, I don't think the media is doing a very good job explaining that. So I've been very frustrated these days, but it's nothing new. See, this is why I like to start with a question like this, because we get to know our panelists and, and their honest views on these tough topics. So thanks to each of you uh, for being a part of this webinar. And I'd like to start with Ellen, um, because Ellen has to leave us at the bottom of the hour. So I want to try and soak up as much, much knowledge from her as possible. Um, Ellen is going to bring us up to speed on three topics that can be quite nebulous unless you live and breathe them every day, and that is budget, budget reconciliation, and the tax reform effort. Um, so as Ellen uh, goes through some of her remarks, I'm going to remind everyone to please submit your questions for Ellen and the rest of our panel um, using the uh, question function on your toolbar, and we will get to those throughout the hour. So uh, Ellen, um, thank you again for making time for us today and helping us understand how the budget affects health programs. Um, could you say a little bit about why that's important to all of us and, and take us through some of your thoughts? Right. Um, thanks so much for having me. So let's remember there are three parts to the budget writ large at the federal level. There is what we think of as spending, which is spending on what we call entitlement or mandatory programs, like Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid and SNAP and SSI. There is spending on what we think of as um, discretionary spending, uh, which is uh, just another term for appropriated spending, since Congress has the discretion to set the levels for those programs. And then there's the tax part of the budget. Uh, taxes are revenues, the same thing. People often think about those as very different, but to be clear, a tremendous amount of what the U.S. federal government spends is in the tax code, right? It provides tax breaks for millions of Americans for things like charitable contributions, or the medical deduction, or the home mortgage home interest rate. So um, that's the broad brush of the budget. So there is not one part of that budget that doesn't affect the elderly and aging policy. So uh, just a quick uh, definitional thing to jump in here, um, and that is that much of the debate this year has been about a process called budget reconciliation. This is just a fancy term for a special process that is used uh, when sometimes when they get a budget resolution conference agreement to create a legislative vehicle, so a real statutory, you know, a bill that will go to the president's desk to be signed, unlike the budget resolution that's just a resolution. Um, and what reconciliation does, which is distinct from all other laws, is it allows a, a bill to move through the United States Senate that only requires 51 votes to pass. It cannot be filibustered. Um, it is only affecting tax programs and entitlement, so it doesn't affect appropriations. And it is a process that Democrats and Republicans alike have used when they want to um, only require a simple majority for a very important piece of legislation. Um, and it has a whole set of rules around it that restrict what can and can't be done. So earlier this year, we used a reconciliation bill for the FY17 fiscal year to move the, the, that's what Republicans use to move forward the repeal and replace under affordable, under the affordable, uh, the ACA, Affordable Care Act. Now, this year's budget debate, uh, which didn't really start until the last couple months, so we didn't, we didn't do a budget resolution uh, in the normal time. So when they finished this year, they created a new reconciliation process that is now moving forward in the House and Senate that is focused on just one thing, and that is to provide a legislative path with this special uh, privilege vehicle, so it cannot be filibustered, only 51 votes, um, for tax cuts. Um, and that is the major legislation before us. The House budget resolution, as you all remember, worried us greatly because it not only provided for tax cuts, although it, it said they should be deficit neutral, it required $200 billion worth of cuts in non-Social Security entitlement programs that could have easily affected SNAP, Medicaid, SSI, and a lot of other programs. It also called for very deep cuts in domestic appropriations, even below the current cuts that are in place that we refer to as sequestration. The Senate bill called for tax cuts and didn't require uh, cuts in entitlements. If you reconcile uh, in the budget resolution, 
entitlement cuts, reconciling is the same thing as basically thinking of it as requiring committees to cut entitlement spending to produce savings. The final budget agreement that was reached not long ago is just one thing. It is a budget resolution that does not require any cuts in entitlements. It can assume cuts in appropriations, but it is not binding. It doesn't have any effect. But it does provide, which only a budget conference agreement can do, a reconciliation instruction that will pave the way for this fast track privilege vehicle to provide major amounts of tax cuts. And in fact, this budget resolution, notwithstanding all the hype and cry and hue and cry about deficits, allows the Congress to pass a bill that loses a trillion and a half dollars of revenues over the next 10 years. Although under reconciliation, you cannot increase the deficit in the second 10 years, and we'll come back to that. So the budget resolution is done, and we are now working on two fiscal tracks in Congress. We have the tax bill moving forward, which I'll come back to, and we have the appropriations process, which has really been on hold. Um, uh, and then separately, and I'm sure Howard and Trish will talk about this, we also have uh, a broad-based health care package that is moving forward uh, slowly, but we hope surely, that we'll do everything from extending the CHIP program to uh, extending funding for community health centers and extending a broad array of, of Medicare and some Medicaid, what we call health extenders. That's about a 25, give or take, billion dollar package of health provisions that need to be extended. Let me start with the probes because it's a little bit quicker and easier. So as you all remember, back in 2010, we imposed a decade's worth of cut in appropriations. Um, and then there was a bipartisan effort to reach um, a, a, an agreement to reduce the deficit. And when that failed, they came back and cut the size of the pie for appropriations a second time. That second cut isn't a programmatic cut. It's a reduction in the total amount of resources available for appropriated programs. That second cut is referred to as a sequester, which is a cut just across the top of the appropriations, the total allocation for appropriations. In recent years, there's been bipartisan agreements to undo those cuts, and they've replaced those cuts with other things like reductions, other kind of cuts in mandatory or entitlement spending, some other kinds of provisions. Well, the sequester is back, and for the fiscal year that started in October, for all of those appropriations bills, we would see deep cuts in the, in the total amount of spending for defense and non-defense that would require the bills to then reduce spending for various programs. Neither party wants the sequester to take effect, and so there is bipartisan and bicameral interest in another deal, probably for two years, that would undo those so-called sequestration or so-called extra cuts. The only way to undo that is to come up with other spending cuts on the entitlement side, most likely. We do not expect Republicans to agree to raise revenues um, to pay for, to replace the lost deficit reduction. Um, the big issue there will be whether Democrats and Republicans will agree that for every nickel of defense cuts that are undone, there will be a nickel of domestic cuts that are undone. Um, so those, uh, the appropriators cannot do their bills this year until they know what the size of the pie is for appropes and until they know um, whether the cuts that are embedded this year will be undone. And most importantly, uh, if they do reach an agreement around that, there is a huge question about how much of the relief from the cuts will make its way to the Labor HHS subcommittee versus making its way to Homeland Security or others. So the appropriations process is on hold until the congressional Republican and Democratic leaders can try to reach an agreement uh, to replace the sequestration with other cuts and then to decide how the uh, extra appropriations dollars will be sprinkled across the uh, across uh, I mean the defense and non-defense would be get an equal amount of relief but how it would be spread across domestic programs um, there was expected to be the, the the government is operating on a continuing resolution until early December it was expected that in December the Congress would come back they would finish all of their appropriations bills probably in one bill that would be referred to as an omnibus appropriations bill. And omnibus appropriations bills, especially when they're the end of the year, often carry all kinds of other legislation as kind of a wrap-up vehicle. It is increasingly, um, there are increasing signals from Republican leaders uh, 
that they will not be able to get the omnibus appropriations bill done in December, that, that will, they'll have to do another short-term continuing resolution and, and kind of stay on autopilot until January, February of next year, at which point they would try to finish the appropriations bills, ironically, for the year that started the previous October. So we are, again, going to be well into the fiscal year before we know what the final appropriations are, assuming they can reach agreement. So that's kind of where we are on the on the budget and appropriations path. And I think I'm sure as Howard and Trish will talk about this emerging health care package, it is quite possible that when they work on this health care extenders package, it would get added to uh, whatever appropriations vehicle is moving. So we might have another continuing resolution in December. And then as uh, then when they get an agreement on the top line uh, undoing sequestration, then the appropriators would spend December writing their bills. But the single biggest action in front of us, and the one that will have by far not only the most significant impact on the elderly, but the most long-term impact uh, in terms of resources available for programs that support the elderly is in fact the tax bill. So as I said, the budget resolution allows the Congress to pass with a simple majority in the Senate a bill that loses a trillion and a half in revenues over the next 10 years. The tax bill that is before us in the House and being unveiled this afternoon in the Senate, we believe actually loses more than 1.5 trillion in revenues. It loses way more than that. Uh, and the Joint Tech Committee has acknowledged that for the House. So what they did is they found ways to, they found some offsets to bring the total amount of revenue loss back down to a net of 1.5 trillion. The bill primarily reduces taxes for corporations and for individuals, but uh, as has been esti estimated before, uh, upwards of 70, 80% of the benefits are estimated to go to corporations and very wealthy Americans. It includes a bevy of tax breaks for businesses. It includes uh, further tax cuts in the estate tax, even though all married couples don't pay a nickel of estate tax unless their income is over $11 million. It increases the standard deduction and has a number of other changes. Um, and the House and Senate have somewhat different bills. The House Ways and Means Committee will pass their bill today, and it will be on the House floor next Wednesday and Thursday, and they intend to pass that bill before they leave for Thanksgiving. The Senate Finance Committee is unveiling their tax bill of uh, this afternoon, and it will have the same fundamental architecture as the House, but it will have some important differences. For example, the House repeals the medical deduction, the, item, the medical deduction for itemizers, the Senate does not. This is effectively a two-step process, or I, sometimes I like to think of it as the two-punch process. The first step is to cut taxes now increase, and increase the deficit. Um, but making sure that they're not increasing the deficit after the first 10 years, which means that the tax breaks they provide have to be sunset at the end of tax year, at the end of the 10 years. But the tax increases they are putting in the bill will remain permanent because the overriding goal for Republicans in the House and Senate for the tax bill is one thing, and that is to provide a very deep cut in the tax rate that corporations pay on a permanent basis. And if that is the goal of the tax bill and you can't increase the deficit in the long run, then you must find permanent offsets to pay for a permanent corporate rate cut. So all of the tax expenditures that are being scaled back or eliminated are, are largely going to pay for permanent corporate tax relief which uh, obviously benefits corporations and very wealthy individuals. When Ryan persuaded House Republicans to abandon the budget that required entitlement cuts and to pass a tax bill that increased the deficit, he reportedly, according to various uh, sources and press accounts, made two commitments to members in the House. The first is that he would come back next year and pursue a deficit reduction bill that could mean a reconciliation bill in the budget that again requires cuts and entitlements. He's also committed to do a welfare reform bill next year that we think will affect programs like Medicaid and maybe SSI and SNAP that could include work requirements and various changes to the program 
that would undercut basic standards and undercut basic protections for recipients. So the bill is going to increase the deficit, but that deficit is not going to be allowed to remain unaddressed. When we have had big deficits in the past, the Congress comes back and they find a way to address that. And in this political climate, we would all probably agree that we're not likely to see members of Congress being willing to raise taxes if the deficit goes up. So what will happen is if they pass this bill and it doesn't pay for the tax cuts and it increases the deficit, deficits in a relatively short order will start to grow. And then conservatives and others in Congress will say, look at that, the deficit is higher, we have to cut spending. Now, Democratic leaders often talk about the fact that the tax bill will put tremendous pressure in cutting Medicare and Medicaid, and that is certainly very much the case. And while you cannot cut Social Security in a reconciliation bill, if you increase the deficit and therefore our debt in the long run, it makes the challenges around Social Security solvency that much greater. But it is not the case that just Medicare and Medicaid will pay for this tax bill. That, that obviously just can't happen. So it is equally important to understand that the brunt of, or that a, a part of the who's going to pay the piper here will fall on appropriations. There is no way that this will not have a significant harmful effect in domestic appropriations in one of two ways or both. We saw a budget resolution pass the House and Senate this year that called for deeper cuts in domestic appropriations below the sequester. They were already taking the deep cuts that were in current law and saying we're going to cut domestic appropriations even deeper. So that is a telltale sign that if deficits go up, one of the places they're going to go is probably not cutting defense but cutting domestic appropriations, which means the sequester will not only stay in place, we could be cutting below the sequester, and we are certainly not going to be making investments uh, in, in housing, in medical research, in all the things um, on the uh, appropriation side that are so important for the elderly population. Um, and I think as conservatives are likely to say now, what are you talking about? We're not cutting anything to pay for this tax bill. They're arguing the tax bill will largely pay for itself. That's an argument that all mainstream economists have debunked and said is grossly misleading. So I think what we can say is this bill makes it very clear and the Joint Tax Committee that it will, in, it will lose revenues to the tune of a trillion and a half over the next decade. That will drive up deficits. And so those deficits are going to likely force these big spending cuts. So the two punch or the two step is cut your taxes now and then come back and cut spending. But the people whose taxes are being cut now are not working families, they're not by and large the middle class, it is primarily very upper income Americans and corporations. Now there are individual provisions in the tax bills that will affect the elderly. So you've got the House and Senate having different uh, approaches to the medical deduction. You have the state and local and uh, state and local income tax deduction, uh, the House has scaled it back a little bit. The Senate apparently is going to repeal the whole thing. Um, that is important tax relief for people in the states. It also is a hugely important source of revenue for states to pay, states and counties to pay for very important public services at the state and local level. Um, but I think the way to think about the tax bill is not to worry necessarily about individual provisions in the tax bill because they may fix some of those and move them. The way to think about this tax bill is this is a bill that will increase the deficit um, to pay for permanent tax cuts for corporations and wealthy ind individuals, which will force deep, deep cuts in the across the board in critical programs for our elderly communities around the country. One other thing to note is that the House and Senate bills, each of them have particular problems and neither bill is likely to be signed into law exactly as it is. There's gonna have to be compromise. And the political pressures are very intense on Republicans to undo some of the provisions they've done that scale back certain tax expenditures or raise taxes on certain, on certain uh, kinds of entities. That means that it will be harder for them to limit their total net tax cuts to 1.5 trillion. 
And so they are going to be looking for offsets. And one of the things that has been put on the table in recent days as a way to make their math work, to kind of keep their net tax cut down to 1.5 trillion, is to repeal the individual mandate of the Affordable Care Act. This Congressional Budget Office yesterday updated its estimate of this and said 13 million Americans would lose coverage under this and millions would see their premiums go up. Significant numbers of people between the ages of 50 and 64 would be affected both by the loss of coverage and particularly by premium increases, um, especially in high cost states. So the individual mandate is not in the bill coming out of the Ways and Means Committee. It's not, I, I don't necessarily think they will add it to the House floor. It's not in the bill that is uh, gonna be unveiled this afternoon for the Senate Finance Committee. But there are strong forces pushing to include the individual mandate in this bill as a, as a, as a way to really, since they couldn't get repeal and replace passed, as a way to really begin to undo the Affordable Care Act. And so we wanna be mindful of that and ready to respond to that as well. So where does that kind of leave us? Well, that leaves us, I think, with a little bit of a conundrum for many groups, because lots of groups don't work on tax policy. They don't work on the estate tax or charitable giving or corporate rates or individual rates. But we have all been in places before where there's a major piece of legislation that could have potentially devastating effects on the communities and programs that we care about. And this is one of those seminal moments. And I think it is incumbent upon us to find the way. We don't have to, we don't have to opine on the estate tax or the corporate rate or the, you know, whatever it is. But I think we do very much have to find a way to say this bill is going to force cuts in healthcare and other critical programs for the elderly. It is going to have a profound impact on aging policy for years and years to come. Neither bill at the moment. Um, has crossed the finish line. It is not clear that, this, that the House bill has the votes yet. We have to look at, see what the Senate bill does, but we know that the Senate bill, uh, for complicated reasons I won't go into, is gonna run into some trouble with House Republicans. And that means that there is an opportunity to try to educate policymakers uh, about the broader threat of what the fiscal impact of this bill would mean for the elderly community. The Senate will vote after Thanksgiving. That means we have time between now and then to educate policymakers, again, there may be specifics within the tax bill that you are worried about, but it is absolutely essential that we not miss the forest through the trees and we keep our eye on the ball that they could fix the medical deduction or they could fix this or that. But as long as this tax bill loses at least a trillion and a half in revenues, there is no question that it will come back and force very, very harmful cuts and changes in the programs we all think are absolutely essential to support our elderly population. So why don't I stop there and turn it back and see if there's questions or I don't know if Howard Thank or Trish you. want to add anything to that. Yes. Thank you, Ellen. This is this is Brian, and uh, thank you so much for those remarks. As complicated as this is, you are really truly the best at explaining it all. Um, let me um, let me. Well, I think we have a a time for just a couple questions. I know you have to run, but could you just I'm say a, a little bit minutes, more? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Could you just say a little bit more about um, our, if you will, the advocacy situation? Because I think many of us were amazed at how um, well the advocates came out and came together to stop the ACA repeal. How do you see this bill as different and how can we respond to get that same pushback that we had for ACA repeal? Right. It's a really good question. Um, I, I, I have had so many members and senators say we have to replicate what we did, you know, in health reform on tax reform. Well, that is virtually impossible. I mean, we don't have the hospitals and the doctors. We don't have the 900 pound gorillas arrayed against this bill. I, interestingly enough, the business community is split over the House and Senate tax bills. But by and large, you have business and, and very well-moneyed corporate and, and political interests that are backing this. So much so that the health, you know, the, 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 the discussions about trying to move forward on health, you know, that's not moving forward because of tax. Um, there was, you know, significant interest. We were supposed to use the month of, of September and October to get a deal on the appropriation sequester so that they could do their bills. That's not happening because of tax. 
the White House was supposed to send up the next supplemental request for Puerto Rico and Texas. That's been delayed because of tax. Everything, all of the decks are being cleared by the White House and the Republican leadership to move this bill forward. And their goal is to is to finish this bill by Christmas. And right now they are on track to do that unless we stop them from doing that. And I think what is now breaking through is is significant amount of not just national press, and this is where you guys are so important, but press at the state and local level are beginning to look at the fact that this bill is gonna have huge adverse consequences, that um, the bill is going to affect funding for state and local programs, that millions of middle-class families may face a tax increase, um, although Mitch McConnell has said he wants to fix that. Even if they don't tax the middle income, they will get a paltry break compared to upper income, and most of those middle income are then going to suffer from benefit cuts, so they're still going to be worse off. So the single most important thing for us to do is to be getting word to people back home and to be educating uh, our, our membership back home, to be educating state and local press so that as the Senate rolls out their bill today, we have next week when the Senate Finance Committee is going to mark up and the week of Thanksgiving to try to persuade a number of Senate Republicans that this bill is the height of fiscal irresponsibility, that it is a bad bill for the elderly, even the Senate bill that does not eliminate the medical deduction now, and to try to persuade them to step back from the precipice and work in a bipartisan fashion on a fiscally responsible tax bill that is focused on working families and middle class and ways of supporting the elderly. If we lose this in December, if this just I mean, there is a steamroller effect that I have almost never seen in my 34 years at the center. They learned from health reform to move quickly. So if we can't quickly start generating some pushback, this will, this will, they'll make it through by Christmas. And then we will be right back in February, not just with them coming back on repeal and replace, but with another round of very deep kinds of budget cuts as those deficits start to mount. So it doesn't mean that anybody has to take uh, a position on the provisions of the tax bill, it means that we have to say to members of Congress, we are deeply concerned that this bill, because it increases the deficit, will have devastating consequences for resources for programs at the federal and state level for the elderly, and we are urging you not to support this bill in this fashion. Thank you. Um, Kelsey, do you have a, a question from the audience? Maybe not. Um, uh, just to clarify on the the second um, the, the the potential second battle that we could have, Ellen, in in February, that again for everybody's understanding would be fall under the reconciliation rules of a simple majority in the Senate. You're talking about the tax bill or the appropriations? Uh... Uh, no, if if um, if they are able to get the tax bill through. And, and then in the um, in early next year, 2018, um, go after Medicare and Medicaid. Um, would, would that be another reconciliation? Yes, type that would be reconciliation um, for FY19. So again, right. Paul Ryan has already said they're going to come back and do deficit reduction. The Freedom Caucus folks have said they got a commitment from Ryan that since they had to abandon the required or, or reconciled entitlement cuts in this year's budget, they'll come back. So I think the right. notion, I want to be clear with people, when I say this bill is going to increase the deficit and it's going to force spending cuts, I don't mean eight, nine years from now. I mean starting very, very quickly. So um, yes. the one thing to keep in mind is if the Senate comes, the, right now the plan is, I think the Senate Finance Committee will pass this bill handily next week. It will pass on a party line vote. They are appealing to moderate Democrats in the Senate. So if those are your senators, you want to be engaging with them as well. But when this comes to the floor after Thanksgiving, just to be clear with people, there's only 20 hours of debate on one of the most seminal pieces of legislation, a generational lifetime decision. 20 hours of debate followed by what we call votorama, which is voting on lots of amendments. But what we know is that when a reconciliation bill comes to the floor, it is very difficult to change. And in this case, trying to undo some of the damage would require kind of offsets and other things. So I think as it moves forward, the more it moves forward, the harder it is to change. So um, 
I want to be clear with people. I've been asked by a lot of different groups, how do I fix the medical deduction or the orphan drug deduction or the child tax? There is no way to fix any individual provision that doesn't change the fact that the bill in toto is still an extremely damaging bill. So that's why I really urge people to keep their eye on the forest and not the trees here. The fact that the Senate, for example, didn't eliminate the medical deduction is great. It doesn't change the fact this is a very, very, very bad bill for the elderly. Um, Senator Bob Casey, who's the ranking Democrat on the Aging Committee, put out a two-page fact sheet today on all the ways the bill is bad for the elderly. So as this moves forward out of the Finance Committee next week to the floor, that is our opportunity to slow this thing down and try to prevent McConnell from getting 50 votes. If he has 50 votes, Vice President Pence will break the tie at 51. They'll go into conference and, you know, they'll be done very quickly. Yeah. Well, I, I know you have to run, Ellen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And, and the ongoing work you do, um, really helping Congress understand their own process. And um, thank you again for your time uh, during one of the busiest weeks of the year. Thanks. Thank you so much for so, having me. Thank you. Um, Trisha, uh, let me turn to you um, to give us a sense of... Uh, yes, I can. Um, okay, and, great. Uh, uh, let me turn to you and, and ask you to uh, give us a sense of Medicare and what we can expect uh, in the coming months and down the road. Um, and um, as you do that, I just want to remind attendees that they can submit their questions um, uh, on the Q&A function on the Thank you. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, that was quite a tour de force by Ellen. And what I want to do is kind of move at a clip to pick up where she left off because uh, the tax bill is an extraordinary, extraordinary change in terms of federal budgeting, which has major implications for Medicare. Um, but before I talk about what kinds of changes could be in store next year that um, Ellen raised, I want to um, turn to exhibit two and talk about just a few Medicare policy issues that are being talked about uh, actually now. So Ellen talked about the tax bill that was that is in committee that would increase the deficit by one and a half trillion dollars, which, which is likely to go to the floor and move quickly through the Senate. This will put enormous pressure on Congress next year, if not this year or the year after to enact major changes to Medicare and Medicaid in order to reduce the federal spending. I'm sure many of you on the call remember the budget summit that took place in the White House when there was concern about the federal deficit and the federal debt. Um, that doesn't seem to be an issue right now, but it's not hard to imagine after a tax cut of this magnitude passes that fiscal conservatives will be back at the table looking to see enormous cuts in, in Medicare, Medicaid, and other programs in order to reduce the deficit that um, will, will grow if the tax bill moves through as it's planned. Um, there is, as Ellen mentioned, a deduction for medical expense, expenses under current law that would be eliminated. That has a huge impact on um, older adults, particularly those with, yeah, thank you for uh, changing the slide, uh, older adults who have long-term care expenses. There are a few other provisions that are um, moving through the House and the Senate. People aren't thinking there's a lot of Medicare going on, but there are some changes. There are higher premiums for higher income enrollees that are being used to offset the cost of the CHIP program. Uh, that would mean for the first time that very wealthy people on Medicare have to pay 100% of their premium for Medicare. Uh, that would be a big difference and a big change in the program and it has been controversial, although it only affects the wealthiest of the wealthiest. There is a concern that over time, the um, higher income related premiums would be phased down and affect even more middle income people. So uh, that's worth watching. The House has also repealed what's uh, the controversial Independent Payment Advisory Board. This is, you know, this is a, a board created by the Affordable Care Act. It is controversial. There are people that have issues with it. But the point I want to leave with you is that uh, repealing this board would increase Medicare spending by $17.5 billion with no offsets. That will ultimately affect Medicare premiums and have an adverse effect on the trust fund. 
when Medicare spending goes up, premiums go up. And this is this, unlike other bills that have moved through, would not find a way to pay for itself. So the question is, what will happen to premiums? Um, at some point, it would be um, worth noting what's going on in the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovations, but given everything else that's going on right now, I don't think we have time to talk about that. And we shouldn't forget um, an interest in changes to Medicaid, either structural reforms to Medicaid like per capita caps or just cuts in Medicaid spending that could affect one in five people on Medicare. So I want to uh, skip over to um, Exhibit 5 because I think this is really the thrust, thrust of um, what we might be seeing next year and the year after. And so I want to spend the time that I have to elevate some of these issues because in order to have meaningful savings in Medicare, which is what could happen if the tax bill goes through, there will be, there's likely to be greater pressure um, on lawmakers to enact substantive structural, what they call structural reforms to the program. But these changes could have a big impact on, on the older, on people who are covered by Medicare. And I think that's why Ellen is, is talking about this, this is a two-step process. There's the tax bill that we see right now, but the follow-up to the tax bill is, okay, now what happens in terms of finding a way to reduce federal spending once again because of the, what's, what, is um, predict predicted to have to happen to the deficit. So, for example, uh, one proposal would be to raise the age of Medicare eligibility to 67. That is something that uh, House Republicans have talked about. It's an idea that's been kicked around for a long time that would reduce uh, Medicare spending but have uncertain effects for people who, depending on what's going on with the ACA, for example, might not be able to get coverage, but it's um, it, it would be a savings item. A second proposal, which is a major reform to Medicare, would be to adopt what's called premium support or defined contribution, or sometimes people say it's expanding the role of private plans in Medicare. This is a, a, a complete shift in the way the program is currently structured. It has the advantage to the government of it limits the government's liability for Medicare spending per person, but it, it shifts the risk onto beneficiaries and encourages them to enroll in cheapest plans in the area. It also makes uh, traditional Medicare more expensive in certain parts of the country. It's a complicated idea. It may be worth giving some thought, but it is a major, major change in Medicare that would be um, looked at as a way to reduce spending. Prohibiting first dollar supplemental coverage, that's already been done a little bit, but there's more that could be done with that. And what that really means is that people would be exposed to higher cost sharing, either deductible, the Part A deductible or more on the Part B deductible. Um, and the idea there is when you expose people to higher cost sharing, they use fewer services. Um, that reduces Medicare spending, but it also means people get less care. Some may be unnecessary, but some may be needed. A uh, fourth idea to keep your eye on a, a proposal would be modifying the cost sharing under traditional Medicare. This is an idea that, that could be structured in a way that provides meaningful new benefits to people in the form of an out-of-pocket cap, but it also could be done to reduce Medicare spending. And one of the ways in which um, it's been talked about most recently would be um, as a saver that would essentially increase deductibles for the majority of people on the program. This is, this is a complicated policy to describe, um, but it's also a popular one and it has, has legs in the house and I, and I could see this being something that comes to the table relatively quickly. I put on this list adopting policies to leverage lower drug prices. Um, that's something that candidate Trump talked about. It's an idea that polls very well. The, the public is very enthusiastic about this, but it's not one that has um, emerged on the horizon. So connecting to what Ellen was talking about, I think it's not a big leap of faith to imagine um, a return to discussions about major changes to Medicare to achieve significant savings with the um, 
with the risk that it would increase cost to beneficiaries. Now, many of these proposals would phase in so, they, so that proponents say, well, we're not going to affect people who are now on Medicare. We're going to affect future generations. And if you look at this um, chart up here, what you can see is the next generation of people on Medicare, say in 2030, they're not going to be all that much wealthier than the current generation. If you look at median income and median savings, the orange line on, on, the, on the slide, there's not much growth at the median. There's no growth at the bottom. It's, it's really the highest income people have the biggest growth. So it's not as if the next generation is going to have greater capacity to absorb rising costs. I um, want to quickly talk about some ideas that are not on the table but are important for strengthening Medicare for the future. One would be to establish an out-of-pocket cap for Medicare coverage services under traditional Medicare. It, it sometimes surprises people to know that Medicare Advantage plans all have an out-of-pocket cap, but traditional Medicare doesn't. It's required for ACA marketplace plans. So on a positive agenda for Medicare, there could be discussion about protecting older adults from extraordinarily high costs. And that, that's one idea that some are talking about, but it's not really being pushed. And to the extent that the government is starved of revenues and there's a real press to reduce spending, it's hard to see how some of these positive changes could occur. Filling the gaps in benefits that result, that result in high out-of-pocket spending, dental, hearing, vision, and long-term care services and supports. Um, you know, they're, they're, it's hard to argue against any of these things, but it's hard to envision how, um, how uh, the agenda will be formed around any of these improvements in the current environment. A third one here is establishing a hard cap on Part D drug spending. We just put out a report that said 1 million people have out-of-pocket costs above the catastrophic threshold in Part D. That's because it's not a, a hard cap. It's a, it's a threshold, and people continue to pay high costs even when they reach that level. That, too, could be on the agenda. And finally, um, just a few more ideas that uh, I think could be on the agenda because, you know, there are things to be done to strengthen the program. One is many people on Medicare purchase Medigap policies, but they, there's not a guarantee issue, right, for people who want to purchase Medigap, and people with pre-existing conditions cannot purchase these policies in many states, um, which essentially means people get locked out of traditional Medicare when they can't buy a Medigap policy. There is some interest in this, um, but um, I, I can't say there's a whole lot of movement on that issue. Uh, I could spend all day talking about strengthening protections for low-income people on Medicare, something I know that um, Howard cares deeply about as well. Uh, people on Medicare do, are subject to an asset test for the low-income assistance they get, unlike the ACA. Uh, so, so more could be done in this area. And finally, and a big issue is how the country will finance care for an aging population. There are I. I, I can't remember the last time I was in a real discussion about financing and with the aging of the baby boom population, it's hard to envision how with current resources, the, the, the Medicare program will be able to grow to meet the needs of this population, but without serious consideration to revenues, um, the, the, ultim the, the impact is likely to be a, sh a shift in uh, costs and risk to the people covered by the program. And that's why I said that's something that keeps me up at night. So there's a lot actually on the agenda, um, and this is just Medicare. And I think Howard is going to pick up and talk about uh, other programs that are at, on the table as well. Thank you so much, uh, Tricia. That's, that's really wonderful um, data and insights. And um, our members will be able to go back and look at some of the slides that you weren't able to um, uh, completely cover um, at, at, at their convenience. Howard, uh, you're, you're the cleanup hitter here, a uh, tough job, but um, what, what can we expect from Congress in the coming months with the budget, Medicaid, which we haven't said too much about, and some of the other healthcare proposals and what they mean for older adults? And, and please tell us, uh, you know, about the um, the tax, re how tax reform might affect older persons and this whole fight to, to uh, stop the proposed elimination of the medical expense deduction. 
Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Everyone can hear me? Yes. Okay. So uh, I've got four slides I'll try to go through quickly so we could take questions. A lot of the materials and advocacy work we've been doing is part of the 70 member leadership council of aging organizations of which GSA is a member. Uh, we're the current chair. We've been focused a lot on the federal budget as Ellen indicated. It's uh, level funded through December 8th, probably kick the can down the road till late January or February. The administration's budget was pretty horrible, frankly, for seniors. It would eliminate six programs that affect older Americans. The Senior Community Service Employment Program, which is the nation's only job training and placement program for seniors. The Medicare State Health Insurance Assistance Program, which provides free one-on-one -on -one counseling. I can't imagine how beneficiaries could navigate Medicare without it. The Senior Corp Programs, which many of you are uh, familiar with, foster grandparent, senior companion, uh, RSVP programs, uh, LIHEAP, the uh, Low Income Heating uh, Energy Assistance Program, about a third of the 7 million households that take advantage of it are 60 plus, and Social Services Block Grant, Community Services Block Grant, both of which cover a lot of important social services for older Americans, adult protective services, nutrition, personal care, et cetera. Thankfully, President's budget's pretty much dead on arrival, but we are particularly concerned about two cuts. One in the House uh, Appropriations Subcommittee uh, that would cut the CSEP program from 400 to 300, uh, and also eliminate the SHIP program. Uh, there's a good funding table that you can take a look at. We're cautiously optimistic that things are gonna be okay because they need 60 votes. You can't do reconciliation uh, for the budget. So they're gonna have to find eight Democrats and I don't think they're gonna go along with cuts like that, but we need to stay vigilant. Uh, next slide, I, I think Ellen is exactly right. It really is keeping me up at night in terms of the implications of the tax reform proposal for programs that seniors have been relying upon for uh, decades, Medicare, Medicaid, Older Americans Act, uh, there's no question, if you look at the statements the members of Congress uh, have made, once they blow a trillion and a half hole in the deficit, the next step is gonna be to pay for it with cuts in what they call entitlement programs or mandatory programs. Uh, they don't wanna be honest and say, we're talking about cutting Medicare and cutting Medicaid. We've already seen, as we'll talk about. Uh, as Brian and Ellen said, medical expense deduction about 5 million people over age 65 use it, oftentimes for very expensive long-term care costs, which can be potentially bankrupting. I'm cautiously optimistic that this is gonna be taken out. The bill will still be very bad. Uh, the Senate, it's not included in there. We're seeing a lot of media on this. We're not seeing much press coverage though for the first point we've raised. And as Ellen said, the process is shocking. Uh, such an important bill. No one's gonna have a hearing on the bill itself. No experts are talking about it. Trying to zip through something that Ronald Reagan took years to try to do. Uh, not a deliberative process. Uh, and I'm afraid a lot of people aren't paying attention or don't understand the implications. So very worried, particularly as Trisha said, since with the aging demographic group, we're gonna need more money, frankly, as uh, people age and live longer to make sure that we can keep the promises for Medicare and Social Security, et cetera. Uh, Medicaid is definitely in the crosshairs. Next slide. Uh, many people don't understand how important it is for older Americans. About 7 million seniors rely upon it, mostly for long-term care, but also for various Medicare low-income protections. Uh, we were rather surprised, frankly, that it was a big part of the effort to repeal the Affordable Care Act because cutting Medicaid and block granting, it has nothing to do with the ACA, but they needed the revenues, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars that were proposed, even though you know a per capita cap is a horrible way to uh, restructure the program, in part because you're, you're locked in to a formula that doesn't account for changes. 
So it doesn't account, for example, for all the 60 to 74 year olds who are going to be, uh, you know, in their 80s when this kicks in and needing expensive long term services and supports and cost two and a half times more. Uh, also, we're very concerned since home and community based services are optional under Medicaid that they'll be more likely to be cut. Um, so we're hopeful that this doesn't come back, although I'm pretty sure it will. Uh, so again, we have to remain very vigilant. We're also worried about some of the waivers that are being considered that would impose work requirements, higher premiums, time limits, particularly on the expansion population. So we're talking about a lot of pre-Medicare low-income older adults who rely upon that. And I think they're going to be looking at uh, waivers that cut back uh, that doesn't need legislation. We're also hopeful that there may be opportunities to actually improve Medicaid. Some Republicans really do support home and community-based services. They're less expensive. People prefer it, keep families together. So we're hoping that uh, the end of the year package might include some of that. So my last slide is on the uh, so-called extenders bill that um, Tricia and Ellen referred to. Uh, again, the uh, engines that are moving the rest of these along are the CHIP program and community health center funding, which is kind of must do. And when LCAO wrote about this, we raised four concerns. One is that those kinds of changes not be paid for by cutting Medicare uh, or cutting benefits. One of the things that you know is always on the chopping block is the prevention of public health fund, which includes senior uh, programs like falls prevention, Alzheimer's prevention, and chronic disease self-management. Uh, I, I do think that we're going to continue to see further income relating premiums. So we're worried about how these extenders are going to be paid for. Second, there's currently funding for low income outreach and enrollment funding for Medicare, uh, under which a lot of folks who are eligible for low income protections don't get it. So we're hoping that'll be extended. There's a provision on uh, therapy caps. It's been part of these extenders bills for quite a long time. There actually seems to be bipartisan support to make the fix permanent, but unless that happens, there are going to be significant limits on Medicare therapy coverage for individuals. And finally, relating to Medicare and home and community-based services, there's a program that expired last October, the Money Follows the Person program, which actually uh, started in 2005, and we're uh, hoping that a bill is going to be introduced next week could get bipartisan support. It uh, permits states to have tools to find people in institutions and bring them back into the community. It so far helped about 63,000 individuals, uh, people with disabilities, as well as older adults, decreasing costs. Uh, we think there's a chance it'll be included in the package at the end of the year, but um, that remains to be seen. So a lot of things going on, and particularly on tax reform, we really need your help. We need uh, folks to get educated. These issues are complicated and let your legislators know uh, about your concerns, you know, focusing probably on some of the same targets we had under the Affordable Care Act repeal uh, efforts. Moderate Republicans like, you know, Susan Collins, for example, maybe we can uh, get them to slow things down and think about this a little bit more at a minimum. So uh, I'll let folks ask questions with the time we've got left. Thank, thank you so much, Howard. That that was really informative, and I I appreciate really the time that you and and Tricia uh, and and uh, Ellen um, uh, gave to us today. Put in your very busy schedules. Um, we've covered a lot of uh, really wonderful information. Um, we're not going to have time for um, questions um, like we do when we're in a conference and people can just wander up, but. Um, our, um, a few people submitted questions, and I will get those to you guys, and we'll put up um, any comments and the answers you have on GSA Connect. Um, so as a reminder, the, the webinar was recorded and will be shared on GSA Connect uh, later this week. Uh, to keep the conversation going, everyone, have, head over to the open forum section now to answer the discussion question we've uh, posted. Uh, thank you again, you guys, for joining us today, and thank you for all the attendees who joined us as well.
I look forward to reading the discussion you may have at uh, GSA Connect. And that's all for